I have with me Dr. Kermit Davis. Uh, he's a distinguished researcher and academic with a prolific publication record and expertise in the field of ergonomics. At present, he's a professor at the Department of Environmental and Public Health Sciences at the University of Cincinnati. He continues to make significant contributions to the advancement of knowledge in ergonomics and the prevention and treatment of musculoskeletal disorders. I also have with me uh, uh, the producer of our show, Aditi Bhatt. My name is Vivek Narayan. Dr. Davis, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Dr. Davis, you have a wide uh, a range of, of topics. As we were doing research, uh, you know, there was uh, literature on ergonomics as it relates to the Air Force, uh, work from home, uh, you know, the changes that are happening in our homes as, as uh, uh, we're looking at uh, taking care of our elderly in the home itself. Um, before we get into all of that, describe to us what attracted you to the field of ergonomics in the first place. Well, that's a very interesting story. It happened to be uh, my wife was coming down to Ohio State and I went to a Christmas party where her uncle was. And he had been doing some work with Bill Maris and got talking and uh, said, oh, you should go talk to this person. Uh, I was an industrial engineer at the time, uh, just graduated from my undergrad. I was looking to figure out what the next steps were. Didn't know what ergonomics was, um, but uh, went and talked to, to Bill Maris. And then uh, he brought me on as a TA and uh so my first work uh, was was teaching assistant and then went into research uh, the winter quarter uh, where we were evaluating uh, a spray handgun um, and, and a new design. And uh, somehow I started taking over research projects and he came to me and said, all right, you're going to start doing research. You're done with the teaching stuff and uh, started working on various uh biomechanical assessments of, uh, it started with hand wrist, um, with cash registers and, and, uh, the, the spray guns and then moved into biomechanical modeling and occupational ergonomics of the low back, uh, particularly, uh, lifting boxes and warehouse work. Uh, and then, uh, where I started doing, uh, studies for my thesis, which was handles and asymmetric lifting, um, and looking at you know the benefits of, of, of handles compared to reducing the weight and the box on, on the biomechanical loading of, of the spine, that transitioned into later uh, looking at the interaction between psychosocial factors and uh, lifting, particularly stress, uh, mental demands, and looking at how that changes coactivation patterns and ultimately the loading on the back. Uh, then I moved down to the University of Cincinnati, where I continued that work, but then transitioned more into uh, healthcare. Uh, and then the last, and particularly looking at assessments in uh, various uh, safe patient handling devices, both in the field at uh, long term care facilities, hospitals, as well as in the laboratory. And then recently, in the last seven years, we have, I have gone into home health care. And looking at the vast uh, exposures, not just ergonomics, but all of exposures uh, for home health care um, for, for a group of workers that are very low wage and often um, underrepresented. Uh, so that and then more recently uh, with COVID, uh, we went into work from home uh, research and, and that seems to continue to have taken off. Uh, and I continue to work in there. And then finally, the other work is looking at the interactions between uh, ergonomics and uh, aerosol exposures. Uh, so it's a wide variety of, of pathways to get to where I'm at now. No, absolutely. Um, and I know that a lot of us are very interested in uh, work from home and, you know, sort of the, the intricacies related to that. But before we get into it, you mentioned something that I thought was particularly interesting, and I don't think a lot of us would think about that. Um, you mentioned something about the psychosocial factors of heavy lifting. Is that did I hear that correctly? Um, could you just just give us a little bit of insight into what that means and why is that important? Uh, why should we be thinking about that? Yeah, yeah, we looked at uh, multiple versions of different psych psycho fa psychosocial factors. Um, the first one was a stress study where we stressed out people 
Um, first, on a no stress condition, had them doing lifting tasks under very controlled circumstances. And then we stressed them out, started yelling at them, telling them why they were messing up and, and basically having an internal stress that put on to them. And the individuals that were particularly extroverts um, responded in a very different way um, than, they did, than uh, introverts. Um, so they, they activated their muscles differently. They, they responded with, with more activation of non or, or antagonistic muscles, non-primary muscles, um, and that lo loaded the spine differently. Not huge values. I mean, it still comes down to the, the you know the, the workplace factors, but psychosocial stress can really impact the the, the long-term loading that's on, placed on the body that el is elevated during stressful conditions. And then my dissertation then went into also how mental demands. So many you know workplaces now include inspection. Uh, reading barcodes, reading uh, invoices, and having all this data processing as simultaneously occurring uh, with 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 lifting, and so now you have the, these dual demands that that occur that again impact the muscle activation patterns and uh, impact the loading on the on the spine and the, and the other joints of the body. And so when you put the you know by themselves mental demands sitting here thinking, well that's not going to cause me back pain probably, mm. but start introducing in a poor posture and you start having these mental demands that can certainly raise the, the levels of force that maybe were borderline on, on tolerance issues to a level that becomes a, a, a an actual injury event. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the interaction of, of the psychosocial conditions can impact the, the biomechanical loading is, is what we showed. I see. Got it. And, uh, you know, I think within the sciences, we hate to generalize, but um, I can't resist myself. Uh, it's not clear to me whether the data would support this in any way, but I think there's an interesting hypothesis around personality and their ability to resist the psychosocial demands and then potentially prevent uh, injury. So would it be that extroverts are more prone to uh, 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 injury because of the psychosocial demands versus introverts or the data cannot say one way or the other? I, I think what the, what the data shows um, and what the research that we did shows, it depends on the task specifically and, and how that stress is, is, is manifested. Um, the introverts, if I remember right, it's been almost 25 years, I think, since we've done the, the initial research. But the, the introverts really um, internalized it and, and took it on themselves, where we did another, my dissertation study, where the, the, the stress was on the experimenters and those extroverts were the ones that responded. So I think what, what it'll show and some of the other people that have done personality, uh, we're doing some work with the uh, Air Force um, uh research that that's that's also showing some of the you know differences between you know is is task dependent on how that stress is manifested so personality certainly mm -hmm. does manifest in different ways but the exact way of it, it, with with different personality types will depend on the type of task and the type of, of psychosocial stress that's being placed on there um, Fair enough. you know so so it really depends on on those type of manifestations I mean, it, it, you know, when you start getting the whole body involved into it, where you get the mind-body interaction, you're going to have a lot more variables coming to play that, that can interact and, and, and get to an understanding of that is, is needs to be a much deeper level than than what we I think we're currently at. So, okay, great. Um, just I think kind of interesting to think about, um, perhaps, uh, especially maybe I don't know. There's a there's an implication of that as it relates to uh, work from home as well, uh, especially in remote settings and things like that. Um, uh, moving on to, uh, I think, what is probably the most intriguing for a, a lot of the audience over here. Um, you know, in 2022, you wrote an article, almost a year in virtual offices remain an ergonomic trouble uh, spot. Um, when you say, when you use the word trouble spot, what is it that you were referring to uh, in that article? So... And, you know, we did multiple studies during the, as COVID came on, because everybody got sent home. Um, and in the early studies, what we showed was that everybody got sent home with a laptop. Mm -hmm. And laptops are meant, um, you know, for, for a, a small period of time. And now they're thrown into an eight hour, 10 hour day at work at home. Uh, we didn't 
providing any peripherals, you know, keyboards or mouse or, or even an external monitor. So, uh, you know, the, the monitor of a keyboard of, of the laptop and the keyboard of the laptop are much smaller than typically are used in, in most work offices. And they oftentimes are lo at a lower position um, on the desk um, because it, you know, that it's meant to be very small and, and, and not have in the, in the proper positions. So that results in, in, in poor postures. Um, and then you throw in that you're on for long durations and, and you start having problems and you were starting to see a lot of differences um, in, in, in the work patterns that people were having at home. We also did a study uh, about six months in, later into it um, and, and to see if, you know, after that, that it wasn't going away. So maybe companies would start supplying, you know, a little better, uh, you know, workplaces at home. And what we found was nothing had changed even six months later. Um, and, and so, you know, what, what and, and I think you still see it to today. Um, you know, we, we, we really documented that very few people um, uh, has, has, has really adapted, um, uh, you know, to, to a, a workplace where, where, you know, many offices, you know, they, we set a, set the, the workers up really nicely um, with proper work stations and chairs and, and uh, you know, computer setups and stuff. At home, we, we, we put them in a dining room table and set them on a dining room cha cha chair and uh, with no supports and, and all that. And, or, or even better yet, we, we sit on a couch or a bed um, in, in, in many environments, um, which, which is not good ergonomic positions, especially if you're doing this for more than a couple hours each day. Um, so, so that's really what we were saying that, that not much had changed after you know, several months or, or a year. Um, and then we kept, kind of continued to, to do evaluations and we're still seeing very similar results um, that, 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 that people still haven't made changes um, in their home uh, workplaces. Uh, we did do studies where we actually had people send in pictures and and we actually recommended doing changes and followed up with them. And we saw the benefits of, of making and, and a lot of it was makeshift um, type of, of, of we, we didn't want to go out and spend and, and break the company's dollar type of deal. It's more, you know, what can we do around the, the house? You know, get you know, can you you know, yeah, you might have to go buy an external monitor, an external keyboard. But then can you raise the, the monitor up by placing on books or uh, other type of, of things that are sitting around? Use a, a, uh, a, a ironing board for a stand table that you could raise up and down um, at different heights and stuff and adjust it to people. So um, there was a lot of cheaper versions of, of things that you could do at home. It might not be as pretty as what you want in an office where customers are coming in, but it uh, you know certainly... Um, was effective in what we saw on, on reducing in you know discomfort and pain that you're seeing. So, I, I recall uh, during that time actually, uh, I had gone to IKEA to get like a standing desk, and IKEA was sold out. Like it was just uh, I had to like hack my way through, get legs from here, get a table surface from there, and it was a bit of an adventure actually. Um, but you touched upon some very sort of basic things that one can do. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, it's it's often said that, you know, sitting on a dining uh, table or sitting on a dining chair or working on a sofa or working in your bed is, quote unquote, not good for you, but people still go and do it, right? So I, I feel as if there's this sense of, oh, it's just more comfortable over here, I, you know, it'll be more comfortable. I'm going to work for like this for a couple of hours, but it's actually not comfortable at all. So, uh, you know, how can we go into this, you know, we're working from home, great, arguably in our pajamas, but, um, you know, how can we resist this temptation that working from the sofa is going to be more comfortable when it's actually worse for us? Did, did, were, was there any insights that, that uh, came from the study that you did? Yeah, I think the the biggest one out of all all our research um, is is that uh, you know taking breaks is is a huge um, a huge uh, factor. Um, you know, every thirty minutes you should be taking a break, getting up, moving around. Whether that's sitting in bed, sitting on a couch, sitting at a, a workstation, 
Um, the body doesn't like static postures. We know that. We, we don't. And, and typically what happens when you get into a work environment, you get, you know, you get involved in everything. You get typing, you get into involved in the, the uh, virtual meetings and all that. And you go from hour, you know, from a, a simple hour to multiple hours and not moving around. And, and to me, the, if, if you could do one thing at home is take 30 minute breaks um, that, uh, you know, we've shown this in, in some of our earlier research um, in the workplace. I think it transitions it well to the, the, the home environment um, and it's particularly just getting them up, moving around and changing positions um, can, can really adapt and make yourself adapt to, you know, poor postures um, in, in many ways um, and, and relatively cheap, too. And this doesn't have to necessarily be unproductive time. It's just sit, standing up a little bit at your workstation, sitting down, moving your, your legs around, moving your arms around, get moving around, getting the blood moving, basically. And then, you know, go back and sit down and, and resume to the next 30 minutes. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you look at if, if there's one thing I would do at home would be, you know, 30 minutes. So if you're sitting on the couch, don't sit there for 30, you know, more than 30 minutes. Um, get up, move around, you know, get, take a break, take, you know, just move your laptop up. You can continue talking if it's a virtual meeting. Most of the time, a lot of times people are off the, you know, not even on the camera. So yeah, you can, you, know, you can mute yourself and, and move things around and just get the, you know, moving. But, the, you know, so often we're, we're starting to put together a study right now looking at, uh, you know, how often people are on uh, virtual meetings and at home when you're working and what's interesting also with, with all the hybrid, you end up going to work and you're still on virtual meetings. Um, and, and so, you know, you're, you're oftentimes wondering, why did I come in? <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, because half the, you know, half the employees are not in. So you're, meet, you're still meeting virtually a lot of times. Um, and you need to make sure that, you know, you're, you're not scheduling back to back ones, especially our, you know, when meetings run you know, all the way, a whole hour, right up to the, you know, no bio breaks, no anything. And then two, three, four, we, we, I think we've gotten a very bad pattern of, of, of having meetings back to back to back to back and, and running throughout the day. Um, I know I have them sometimes and I have to get myself to, to take breaks um, periodically. No, uh, what, what you're saying actually resonates. Uh, uh... I ended up uh, onboarding for a new role uh, maybe a couple of months uh, into the pandemic. And it was virtual onboarding, back-to-back uh, -back meetings. And I ended up, you know, at one point, my calendar was just filled with back-to-back -back meetings. And then I would, I sort of was trying to make subtle hints that, you know, uh, don't accept meetings within 15 minutes of each other and, you know, those sorts of things. And then people were complaining, it's like, oh, Vivek's not a, a, available and, you know, things like that. And I'm like, look, guys, uh, this is not a healthy way of, 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 of doing work. Uh, and how I've does one seen, internalize? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I've actually seen um, schedulers where now are, are, you know, starting meetings either at the 10, you know, 10 spot, 10 after the hour or yeah. ending meetings 10 minutes before the hour yeah. and enforcing it that, you know, you can only have a 50 minute meeting is the maximum. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I use, we use Google calendar um, and it has the option of, even though it says, you know, half an hour, it's actually like a 25 minute meeting. And then, you know, you have to, one has to be good about it, of course, um, and be disciplined. Um, I think, uh, uh, creating agendas is is the way to go on that front, and not let the meeting sort of you know continue on uh, unnecessarily. Um, uh, I know that uh, you are doing uh, uh, research into burnout. You just mentioned it right now as well. Um, obviously, that research is still underway, so there's nothing that uh, we can talk about from a conclusion perspective. However, um, uh, is, is there? A, do you have hunches that you could share with us or or just describe to us why this is important? Um, I think you've alluded to it already, but, um, you know, perhaps uh, maybe this is the future. And if it is, we probably need to understand more about it. Is that kind of how you're approaching the uh, the study? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the future is going to be, I think, the, the sort of the uh, horses out of the barn and we're, we're not going to go back totally to 
an all, work in the office totally. I think workers are going to rebel to that. They want to be a hybrid. They want to be able to to work at home some days. Um, and I think that uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, I think that uh, you know that burnout is is going to be real um, as demands get more and more on on workers, especially mentally, especially with virtual meetings. Um, I think that plays a big role into them and how they're scheduled. But you know, I think that uh, we, we we are able to uh, start identifying some of the factors of burnout. I think personality is going to be a role of that. I think uh, ultimately the scheduling. Um, as well, both, uh, you know, on a daily scheduling, as well as the virtual meeting schedules, having built in downtime, uh, time away from the, the screen, um, I think will all be things that, that will be specific to work from home uh, type of environments. But we know burnout has major impact. Um, we know a healthcare system that, that has got tremendous burnout right now. Uh, we've done a lot of work in there identifying nurses as as being on high levels of burnout. And that just creates turnover, it creates poor uh, performance and uh, and so on. So I think, you know, we, we're getting into a new world, I think, in many aspects of that. Dr. Davis, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, nurses and uh, burnout within sort of the hospital or the healthcare system, which kind of brings us to an interesting thought I mean, you know, some people would argue that hospitals really aren't built for healthcare. Um, you know, there's this whole sort of uh, a movement, you know, healthcare by design. Uh, clearly, you've done some research and some work in this area. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, uh, hospitals of the future? What are the ergonomic issues related to uh, healthcare in the in the hospital setting? And then I know you've done some research in the at home setting as well. So maybe we can transition into that uh, uh, afterwards. Yeah, so I think with hospitals, um, you know, the, the healthcare is constantly changing on, on the, the, the actual delivery of, of healthcare. Um, you know, I have uh, a friend of mine that went, that went through a hip replacement, totally re hip replacement and was home in a couple hours, five hours. I mean, it, it, you're not staying in hospitals as long. Um, only the most serious cases, um, which often means that uh, patients are are unconscious or um, are, are in, in, in positions that that need to be constantly um, attended to by, by nurses. And so I think you know the numbers of, of patients that nurses can handle at a, a given time because they're getting sicker and sicker, the ones that are in hospitals um, are, are certainly, playing into the roles of burnout. I think that's one of the things that we learned from COVID, uh, having you know tremendous numbers and, and being able to balance all of the care of them. Um, and, and, and particularly, you know, when a patient's laying in bed for many, you know, long periods of time, you have to, you know, move patients and there's not a, a way a patient can, can be moved safely manually. It should be done with, with some type of lift assist and, we're still not there in many uh, parts of, of the United States or even the world of really getting to have, uh, you know, say patient handling equipment and get engaged um, in, 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 into a high level of, of participation. Um, and so, you know, low back injuries are still one of the, the primary injuries for a nurse or a reason why a nurse leaves, leaves the, the hospital. Um, and, you know, have debilitating type of injury. But, you know, we certainly are also seeing burnout being a, a, a bigger problem also, which leads to depression and, and, and stress and breakdown um, mentally um, and other aspects. So I think that that, that it's, it's, again, the whole system that we have to really be taking care of. And, and, and to me, one of the weak links is, is the nurses. And, and that's the one that, that is the day-to-day the -day care. Um, certainly doctors are very important, surgeons and all that are part, important components of that, but the nurses are, are, are to me, the bread and bones of, of, of it uh, and, and really need to, to, to really get into um, understanding how those demands on those workers um, that's going to, you know, keep the, the, the hospitals afloat. I do think, you know, the future is home health care. Um, we're seeing that shift now. 
Uh, we're seeing it's the fastest growing uh, industry in, in all industries in the United States, um, as well across the, 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 the world. Uh, I've done research on home health care in the UK uh, last year, uh, and we're starting to do some comparisons to the exposures and and, and uh, what they what they perform and how they perform it in in the in the homes. You know, one of the things with with home health care is every home is a different work environment. Um, you know, you're going to anywhere from four to five to six, seven places a day, um, and each day is a different day. Um, of, of, of workplace stressors, and that can be um, something that 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 is very unique um, exposures, such as you know having uh, pets um, running around, pests, uh, bed bugs, and, and and cockroaches that that change the way you you uh, interact with patients. You become a one arm uh, nurse um, because you don't want to set anything down to, be, to 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 take it to the next house. You have driving, you have egress and ingress type of, uh, of the house that might be in the snow or in rain that, that, that has different type of, of slips, trips, and falls issues. You have poor uh, ventilation. You have uh, no safe patient handling equipment, at least in the United States, in homes typically. So you're there, and you're there by yourself. Um, and so this is, you know, oftentimes you have to phone a friend to have any type of interaction with colleagues where... In a hospital, you go next room and you talk to them and you get input and and, uh, and you can't do that in a home healthcare setting. Uh, we we are seeing that you know patients are living longer. We're getting better at treating. We're getting more chronic diseases, and we have a, a big population of, of baby boomers that are coming up through the systems um, across the, the the world. That people are living longer and want to be in their homes and. Uh, and I think there's some very unique um, exposures in the different homes, uh, care, home care from across the, the, the world. And I think we'll get some ideas of that when I start to get finished comparing uh, what we're doing with uh, the UK uh, data set and, and the United States data set that I have. Um, so it, it's it's a very unique um, experience. Um, I mean, I've even been approached, you know, where you know, I think the future could be that you drive up in a, a semi truck and you're doing surgery outside and you walk them back into your home. Very um, intriguing. I mean, I think that 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 that's out there. Um, you know, and and you know, the conceptually that that there are people are working on those type of things um, where you know, home will be home. You know, you'll get deliver the pizza and you'll deliver the you know, the healthcare um, um, to your door type of thing. I think in the future. Um, cause I think, you know, hospitals don't want patients in, in their, in their hospitals cause they have to worry about infections and bed sores and, and, and slips and falls and all that, that, that are not covered by insurance and, and have to be covered by the hospital. So that, you know, all these type of things are hitting their bottom line and, you know, if they're sending them home, they don't have to worry about that as much, I believe, um, in, in the home healthcare setting. So, um, I see this as a, the, the new, on the horizon of, of what uh, you know what what will be um, you know the, the the place where where probably a lot of the healthcare will start resolving or re, or revolving um, when when you you look to the future. I mean, we started seeing that with virtual uh, appointments and and that during the pandemic, and those are still being around and, and will continue, I think, and will expand as, as, you know, insurance companies cover them more often and stuff. So, um, you know, it, it is an environment that uh, is, is ripe for a lot of ergonomics and human factors issues. Um, and we, we're just starting to understand the nuances that you have there. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Um, uh, within the Indian culture, there is, um, you know, you have multi-generational families. So the my grandparents actually were at home and, you know, there was a schedule of adults that would sort of rotate looking after them and things like that. Uh, my grandmother actually, actually ended up losing a lot of her eyesight. And so we went in and retrofitted the entire room with, you know, making sure that there were no trip hazards, there were no sharp corners, that, you know, if she needed to wake up... Uh, at night to use the restroom, she would have, you know, dim light enough uh, without any trip hazards, uh, you know, getting up and down from the toilet seat. We had a rail that was put in, um, you know, the the home as we know it, I think um, is 
is facing some onslaughts, right? We have to work over there. Now we have to age well inside the home itself. Um, you know, I, I'm very interested to, to know what happens with, uh, you know, wh what happens with interior design moving forward. I mean, I know you mentioned in our earlier conversation that elements of your house have been sort of built with ergonomics in mind. And I think that's just going to be more of a thing now moving forward. Yeah, I, I think I think that's one key that we need to do better as a profession is to get, uh, you know, so many times I see architecture and interior designers that maybe know some of the concepts of ergonomics, um, but they don't seem to practice it. I, I can't tell you how many times, mm -hmm. you know, not even just at home a type of one, because that's that's going to start coming because I, I do think as, as you know, we, we've had a concept of, of you know, all countertops and, and cabinets have to be this height. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're taller or shorter, they need to be this height. Um, and, and, and I think as we get better understanding um, and, and, and probably better designs that the cabinets will be able to may, maybe adjust heights better um, so that, you know, the problem is, is you, you design it, at, you know, the, the certain height so that when you go to sell it, you're, you know, you haven't designed exactly. it to a shorter person and the next person in the home is, is you know, has to gut the place because it's you know it's too short for them, but you know there are things that that uh, you know we we can start designing, and I think in the future we'll probably end up with uh, you know adjust. I mean it's all about adjustability. I mean that's the same thing when the workplace and and, and, and the home is, is going to be that way. Um, you know yeah I have put some designs in uh, some of my countertops. Uh, I have fork surfaces that are higher that that are, are better for for uh, cutting and uh, preparing food uh, that especially for me versus my wife. Um, and, you know, there's some of the regular surfaces too, um, but that just gives you sort of a, a, a gamut um, of, of, you know, of ability to, to uh, adjust um, to different height individuals. Um, you know, I've also designed uh, some of my cabinetry for, uh, you know, things to be stored and, and be able to pull out and be at the right height. Um, and uh, as well as, um, you know, it's ease of, of use, um, forces to open things and, and that, that, that take into consideration, I think. And that's some of the things that, that I think we have to get better at, at collaborating with, with interior design individuals that make things look really cool and, and new and fresh, but, yeah, that doesn't, after you sit in it for some time, it doesn't necessarily work out to, to being a, a really good work environment if you're working from home. Um, uh, or even in offices, I've seen so many uh, workstations. Um, I go in and, and, and people are, are, you know, have designed these uh, collaborative work areas and you sit there and you look, you sit down and it's like, well, nobody, this can't fit anybody. I mean, it, the, the, the the seat is too wide and, and it, it's way back. It doesn't have any lumbar support. It's, it, it, and, and, and if you were meant to, you know, you know, to, you know, make sure people aren't going to sit around and work there, it's probably a good thing that, it, that it's designed that way and it looks good. But, you know, if you want them to collaborate more than 15 minutes and, and interact, it, it probably needs to start taking in some of the ergonomic considerations. Um, I, I've been in several offices where they put these ones in and then you go back and talk to them. Well, nobody uses them. Well, yeah, they look cool, but they don't, they're not functionally ergonomics. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, if you go back in the medieval chairs and, and, and I, you know, I went to a lot of castles in, in England when I was there last year and on sabbatical and, and, you know, they have a lot of cool chairs, but none of them were ergonomics and none of them were meant to sit in very long. <laughs> <laughs> they're ceremonial. <laughs> Yes. Talking about uh, talking about the, the the built environment, though, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you've been to uh, Barcelona, but um, there is a, a hospital over there that was built, I think, in 1901. Um, uh, it's uh, the uh, if I remember correctly, Hospital of the Saint Cross in Saint Paul or something like that, and it's such a well built hospital. I mean, you know. As, as a medical student myself, as and I worked for a couple of years as a physician, and then my partner, who's also uh, in the health field, both of us were just agog at this modernistic thinking of how a modern hospital should be designed. And, you know, to your point, these aren't new concepts. It's just for a variety of reasons and perhaps systemic reasons, we're just not able to execute and 
on on what it is that we need to be doing. So um, it's it's unfortunate, um, but uh, I think uh, you know with with the work that you're doing, at least as it pertains to this new era of working from home being taken care of at home, um, I think there's some valuable lessons to be learned from that. Um, Switching switching gears uh, somewhat, I know that uh, you're conducting a workshop for the uh, uh, conference in September. Uh, what can we look forward to in that uh, workshop? So this will be a, uh, a workshop on work from home. Um, and it'll be, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the concepts, getting everybody, you know, across the concepts of, of the monitors, the keyboards, to, to uh, laptops, to, to uh, 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 other input devices uh, to virtual meetings to uh, and, and it'll you know be scientific based. What others in some of what my research, what all what others have have identified, um, and and go through you know, all the different concepts and, and what you're really looking for, showing examples of of. of you know, really getting to, to how to uh, all the different concepts and really the, the wide ranges of, of things that can be there going into why you need breaks and, and, and uh, you know, the, the research as well as, as what the proper lengths are of break wise and, and, and going into, you know, you know, how the impact of, of, of them on cardiovascular and diabetes and all that research that's also out there. Um and then you know the, the second part is to to really um, go through the process of evaluating. Um, so I'll have uh, many settings uh, through video and pictures, um, very similar to what we did uh, with our, our, our one of our initial studies, where we took pictures of workstations and all the variety mm -hmm. of workstations and the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, workstations. Um, and even some of the, the the best workstations still had some issues that they could really, you know, why why this should be lined up and where they should be lined up, what's missing, um, what can be done on, you know, what, what are some of the interventions or or things that can be done um, on uh, you know in a cheap way versus going out and buying a you know six hundred eight hundred dollar chair versus all right you have a chair here what can you do and and to to making it a, a better situation than what it is. Um, and going through lots and lots of examples like this of, of the many variety that we've had over the years that I've, I've collected and, and, and get the input. And so that you'll be able to come out of the workshop being able to assess, you know, your, your employees or, or your own workstation on how to, to, to really impact and make sure that you're, you know, you're working from home, you're working from the office. Um, you know, in a, a practical and, and, and a good ergonomic um, postures. That's brilliant. Um, you mentioned something that I, I'm particularly interested in. So you mentioned, you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, so loosely metabolic syndrome. And I think, you know, selfishly, uh, for those of us who are working across time zones and things like that, you know, you take early morning meetings and then you sort of take late night meetings. And, you know, we know that to stay awake, you're cortisol levels need to be up and that leads to insulin sensitivity. And so, you know, uh, it's, have we started thinking uh, about ergonomics and, and work from home and sort of hybrid work along those lines where we're saying, you know what, our work habits are leading to, like, there is a recognition that lifestyle disease and things like that, but now it's like almost, uh, at least in my mind, there's a clear link between the way we work and lifestyle disease completely now, right? I mean, I don't think there's any doubt left anymore. So. Yeah, I think, you know, I think there is support out there. Um, I would have to, I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't say I'm an expert in that area at this point. Um, I think uh, they'll be brought out in the workshop. So I, I will be, I don't say an expert in it, but I will be bringing out the pros and cons. I mean, I did do a debate with, uh, David Rempel, um, the Human Factors Ergonomic Society, a couple of years ago, um, about this exact same, uh, you know, the, looking at at Sistan basically and um, and and all the aspects. But it, you know, it, again, it gets to it's all a system. And have we gotten to the point really to understanding that? I would say probably not. Um, but I think we we are getting, as you said, 
indicators that that are pointing in those directions. And um, so I think, yeah, that that you know, I, I well maybe in a few years we will have much better, you know, better studies conducted. And I think part of it is we just haven't done the studies, um, you know, involved in that type of thing. So. Okay, um, we are running out of time. Uh, uh, I think uh, one of the key messages that I heard, at least from what you were describing, uh, is you know if you are working from home, taking breaks is important. Uh, you know, uh, no, no, I would say and... whether you're working at home or in the office, taking breaks uh, is important. Enough. That's not. Fair I mean, enough. certainly it is for working at home, but it is is equally important for in the office. You need to take breaks. So, yes. Right. And and there are some, I think, uh, I don't want to say hacks, but there's some clever ways in which one doesn't necessarily need to spend a lot of money, but can make some common sense uh, uh, solutions and improve the, the, the ergonomic situation at home or in the office for that matter. Um, so I think that would be quite useful for our audience members. And I'd encourage them to actually, uh, it, you know, if someone wanted to find out more about this uh where should we be pointing them at? Should we uh, send them to your uh, uh, academic homepage at the University of Cincinnati? Or uh, what would be a really good way of directing uh, people who are interested in learning more towards some of the work that you've done? Oh, I mean, I think, um, you know, there are, there, there's a EID, um, uh, ergonomics and design article that talks about a lot of the, the cheap uh, and, and, and effective interventions and, and, and the issues that, that, that are out there. So that's a, a good article to start with. Um, I think that uh, you could certainly go to my homepage. Um, I don't know if I have all these updated to there. Um, I got an easy name. You can search on Google Scholar and, and certainly get all the articles that way. Um, I think that also you can, um, you know, there, there are many articles, many, spe you know, I had a special issue in the, the uh, work journal um uh that that is out there uh um i think there are you know, you know certainly come and come to the, the conference and, and attend the workshop and and the, the keynote will also be a highlight of of of, of my uh work from home uh that's what i'll be talking about um and then i'll also have a uh symposium on uh say patient handling um and uh that I'll be putting on on a, a, a one of the sessions also. So, um, you know, I think th there's, I guess, many different aspects that you could go out there um, and, and search pretty easily and find information about uh, how to, to, to do this. So. I think also, I, I was going to say, there's also a, 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 a tip sheet um, uh, for, um, Human Factors Economics Society also has out there that tells you things that you can do um, to, to help work from home and stuff. Brilliant. Um, so anyone interested in safe patient handling, uh, uh, workplace and work from home, uh, uh, work situation assessments, those sorts of things, please do uh, uh, consider attending uh, Dr. Davis's workshop um, with that. Dr. Davis, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, certainly very informative uh, for me personally. So uh, thank you for this. This is brilliant. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for having me.